assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen welcome to the second episode of the dental talk i hope you liked our first episode we promised that we will start at home and we are going to go big and big we're going ladies and gentlemen today we have one of the greatest dental personalities with us here tonight today we have had the honor of interviewing dr stephen rosenstein now i am sure if you graduated bds if you've studied final year fixed prosthodontics in pakistan you have read his book this ladies and gentlemen here is his book this is the book i used to study for my final year fixed prosthodontics and it went well i passed prosto and so you know how big a personality he, he is he has done research in prosto magnanimously ladies and gentlemen and i am sorry i wanted to do his introduction without reading a text but it's so massive i just cannot so i'll start uh, reading i'll try to focus on the camera as well uh, so dr rosensteel he's an educationist he's a researcher and a specialist in restorative dentistry prosthodontics presently he's a professor of restorative and prosthetic dentistry at the ohio state university college of dentistry where he maintains his intramural prosthodontic pro- practice He is a 1973 dental graduate of Birmingham University in England ladies and gentlemen that means he has almost an experience of up to 50 years in dentistry he did his masters in pro- prosthodontics from the Indiana University in 1977 he taught fixed prosthodontics at the University of Florida the University of London and before joining Ohio State in 1985 Dr Rosenstiel is the editor in chief of the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry secretary and past president of the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics he is the president of the Carlo Bauchu Con- conference past president of the prosthodontics group of the International Association for Dental Research the John and the John F Johnson Society for Advanced Prosthodontics and the Fixed Prosthodontics section of the American Dental Association so and the introduction is nearly over he is also one of the authors of the textbook contemporary fixed orthodontics which has sold 60000 copies all around the globe and is considered gold standard in fixed prosthodontics it has also been translated into 11 languages ladies and gentlemen he has authored over 180 scientific articles and abstracts was honored with the 2015 Dinguish, distinguished service award from the american college of prosthodontics for 20 years 22 years of contribution ladies and gentlemen so with a profile like that and i'm sure all of you this introduction says nothing about him he has 50 years of experience in dentistry ladies and gentlemen and that is no short of a lifetime so five decades in dentistry i am sure he had a lot to teach us i am sure he had a lot of knowledge to give us so without further ado it is my utmost pleasure and it is my utmost honor this is probably the peak of my career so far at most honor i present to you without any further ado dr stephen rosenstein you you might be joined by my pussy cat here yes. <laughs> no nah, that's that's absolutely fine we'll we'll enjoy the company we'll enjoy the company okay so with your permission sir okay Hello and good morning. Okay. <laughs> Hello and good morning, sir. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. No problem, sir. Sir, first of all, I would like to begin by saying how big of a of an honor it is for me to be talking to someone like you. And thank you so much for taking time out oh, for us. Very kind. You're very kind. Thank you very much. Uh how's the quarantine life go? life going sir how's the lockdown everything with this covid situation yeah i mean i'm i'm seeing patients mainly mm-hmm. emergency patients but gradually more more patients in the practice so that's getting and the students are just coming back i think the ones that need requirements to graduate they mm-hmm. get those requirements so okay perfect hopefully, you know when the some of the states that have brought things kind of near a normal they've had a big spike so mm-hmm. it's probably going to happen here you just worry about that okay okay so with your permission sir should we start the interview of course <laughs> okay so sir let's talk a bit about you how about you introduce yourself to the audience everyone obviously knows you here in pakistan but 
you know, just introduce how did you get into dentistry back in the 1960s? I assume you want you decided you wanted wanted to be a dentist. Why was that, and how was your journey through dental school in that era? Okay, yeah. So I'm originally from England, so yeah. I understand. You know, so okay. I can. Uh, I know you guys enjoy cricket, so I enjoy ah, cricket. Perfect. We, we, we love cricket. We love cricket. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I know the, all the famous Pakistan cricketers, uh, but she, her business started, it was gold inlays, onlays grounds, and also the porcelain jacket crown. She was very okay. good at making those and on platinum oil. So as a little kid, I'd, I'd help in the lab, sometimes packing parcels to send to the dentist. And, okay. and so, um, but yeah, so I kind of always wanted to be a dentist growing up as a okay. kid. And okay. I, I think it, as a teacher, I know many of the students have family members in dentistry. So at least right. in England, the United States, it, it kind of tends to be a family thing. I don't know yeah, if yeah. that's yeah. so in Pakistan. So, uh, yeah, so I went to dental school in England, in Birmingham, England, mm -hmm. and um, graduated, as you say, in, uh, in 1973, so yeah. a long time ago. I'm, I'm retired now, but I still practice a day a week. And then I went after dental school, I did a residency house job in Birmingham, and then was in private practice for a year. And then I went to graduate school in the United States. Mm -hmm. Osteonics. And at that time, in England, there weren't really graduate programs, mm -hmm. graduate programs in prosthodontics. So people that I talked to suggested I go to the United States to get that sort of training. Okay. And our, uh, so that was Indiana University. Yeah. And my co-authors of the textbook, Dr. Martin Land, Dr. Junei yeah. Fuji, they were classmates of mine okay. at Indiana University. And then after Indiana, I taught for three years at Florida yeah. and very, very famous faculty at that time at Florida, uh, Dr. Harry, Harry Lundin was my mm -hmm. uh, department chair and he's very well known in the field of occlusion in, uh, in, in prosthodontic. Yeah. And then I went back to England and taught at King's College in England okay. for five years and then came back to the United States in 1985 mm -hmm. and after teaching at uh, the Ohio State Ohio University State. In, Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio since then and then retired uh, when I became a prosthetic dentistry so that um, kind of okay. that I could do that job as a retired faculty you know I didn't have to teach and also that's dentistry. amazing that's amazing so that, yeah. that helped a lot so okay. that's a long, uh, long career. In yeah, absolutely. Industry and hopefully you'll have the same. So when did you graduate? I just graduated last year, sir. I graduated in 2019. <laughs> so if I have to reach, at, reach to your level, I'll have to practice till 2069. So <laughs> hopefully you will. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, sir. Okay. So my next question to you is that who were those dental professionals earlier on in your career that had a positive impact on your career as mentor as in as a mentor at that time so i've, I've been fortunate had so many outstanding absolutely um, and colleagues and mentors and um we, 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 in birmingham university one of the faculty members at birmingham university then moved to canada steric jones and he became uh, president of the IADR, the International Association yeah. of Dental Research. So very well-known biomaterials researcher. And yeah, he, he was a teacher in Birmingham. And the other faculty in Birmingham were very, very uh, focused clinically. And also they, they did a lot of research at that time, particularly biomaterials research. And then at Indiana, uh, the department chair was uh, Roland Dykema. He was very, very well known in uh, prosthodontics. Mm -hmm. that, and my program chair was Ned Van Ruckel. Uh, again, exceptional clinician, meticulous, uh, very high standards. And that's 
kind of what you need as a teacher is someone to, to do things. So I was fortunate. That and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Land and Dr. Fujimoto, we yeah. wrote a textbook together, classmates together, taught together at Florida. So beautiful. So they have been very fortunate. Beautiful, beautiful, sir. Okay, so we know you did your postgraduate in Prosto back in 1977, but we have to ask what made you choose this specific field at that time? Well, again, I think it's because I mean, that's what I enjoyed the most in dental okay. school. So I didn't, and at that time in Prosto, we weren't placing, I mean, implants really hadn't started yet. Yeah, so that was. Prosto and we and certainly we weren't placing so there was no surgery and I, I yeah. did and I did quite a lot of surgery I never really liked the smell of blood all that much so okay. <laughs> I, I preferred you know doing the kind of the precision stuff mm -hmm. the, the gross stuff so I okay. always enjoyed Brown and Bridge dentistry and was okay. uh, fortunate to be able to study that in the oh, perfect 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 Okay, so, sir, so you've been in dentistry for 50 years. That is a very, very long time. That's basically half a century. So you've obviously seen dentistry and prosthodontics change exponentially over the years. What are those major changes? If you had to list down a few, what are those major changes that you've seen in dentistry, whether they can be amalgam to composites or dentures to implants, what would they be? So the first one, and you won't believe this, is that when I started dental school, the high-speed turbine was new. That was like the new thing. Okay. So the alternative was the slow-speed uh, handpiece with a belt-driven handpiece that rattled the patient. And oh. That. And the, uh, in dental school, we weren't allowed to use the high-speed handpiece until our second clinical year. So first, we had to do all the preparation with a slow speed handpiece and then we took a test uh, because they thought the high speed handpiece was far too uh, aggressive for aggressive. Yeah. dental students, first clinical year dental students. And then when I, I thought, you know, this was kind of silly, but I talked to my father about it who graduated dental school in 1948. So wow. That's <laughs> Whoa. Okay. And he said, when he was in dental school, that tungsten carbide burrs were the newest thing. So before wow. tungsten carbide burrs, they had steel burrs. And they had exactly the same, that the faculty thought the students couldn't use tungsten carbide burrs because they were too aggressive. So they had to start on using steel burrs. So, so nothing much changed. So that was the first huge mm -hmm. thing. Second huge thing, as you mentioned, was composite resin and particularly the light cured, command yeah. cure, composite resin. That that made a huge difference. Bond, you know, has made a huge difference. Absolutely. Um, one was dental implants, like you mentioned in prosthodontics, particularly. That's totally revolutionised. Absolutely. And then CAD CAM is is the most recent change. Yeah. And we, um, you know, accept our changes to our textbook as we revise the textbook and the changes to the general prosthetic dentistry. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of the articles are focused on digital dentistry and how that's, that's changing. Uh, so the, yeah, so exciting times. It, uh, beautiful, it never... beautiful. I did not know that your, I did not know that your father was a dentist back, a graduate of 1948. That is, that, that's very interesting. That is very interesting. Okay. Manchester University. And he had, he wrote, and if you look on PubMed, you can find E. Rosenstiel. You'll find his articles. Oh, what's so, his name? What's his name? So Edwin was his first name. So oh, okay. If, if Rosenstiel is not, not a very common name. Yeah. And my son is a church, so he's Paul Rosenstiel. And oh. <laughs> you can look at his papers in kidney and so on. But, uh, but dentistry, it's pretty well me and my father. So. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so sir, even after doing your postgrad in Prosto back in the day, when such postgrads were really, really scarce, you went into academics, you went into research, 
and now you've trained thousands of young dentists either directly or indirectly so i wanted to ask how has that experience been as an academician and how important is it for a dentist to go into uh, as a dentist to go into academics so my plan was private practice so i i after graduate school you know my plan was to go into private practice and then my friend dr kujimoto who graduated a year ahead of me yep. from indiana said oh you should come to florida you'll learn so much from dr landine and dr thank you um, parker mahan and so on that i said oh, okay so i you know i was going to do a couple of years in florida ended up doing three years in florida um and then i really enjoyed the teaching so then when i went to england i, I was offered a job at king's college and really enjoyed that and uh, pursued that academic career in the united states and got research funding I was fortunate with that and promotions and, and so on so uh, yeah that's it's a nice career academics I know in in some countries perhaps also in Pakistan um, you have to essentially make your money in private practice yeah. and the, the teaching is for the reputation um, yeah. in the United States we, we practice a day so there's some income from that but most yeah. of our income comes from our yeah, absolutely. being a professor, you know, so that just varies, yeah. I know, you know, in some countries, my colleagues different in Egypt or different countries, they work really, really hard. So they're at absolutely. the school in the morning and then in the evening, they're working their practice to and make same is the case over here. Where, same is the case over here, just like that. So yeah, it's tough, yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully, you know, in in your career, that if you go into academics, you'll find you know that it'll it'll change and there'll be better funding for for universities. So hopefully, you, so will. I mean, it, it's important to. I've always practiced, so it's yeah. important to practice to, you know, keep up your skills, keep up the new with the new in, information. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, if you if all you do is practice, then it's hard to devote yourself to the academics. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So, sir, we know that you're such an accomplished researcher in the field of dentistry with over 150 plus articles to your name. How has that evidence-based learning helped you in academics and clinical practice? So I've always enjoyed the research. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I think the best way to approach research is from, you know, from your practice, try to figure out what what you're not sure about what you don't know and then and then maybe there's a a lack of knowledge which requires some research and you know, one project kind of leads to another absolutely graduate students they all have to do a thesis so yeah. always look for new things to research absolutely so the general prosthetic dentistry we get articles from every country of the in the world it's yeah. a very national field now yeah. so you know we get lots of articles from pakistan so uh, keep them coming we we enjoy enjoy absolutely getting. thank you so much sir. um so where did that passion for research start from if i had to ask um i wasn't i mean i think from you know from my thesis that was the first time i've done any research and i uh, figured out a, something that ought to be tested and yeah. ran the project to do with impression materials, you know, back the, the, they were some new materials at that yeah. time that didn't behave quite like the old ones. So we tested, I tested a few things. And then you have to do all the statistics and you learn yeah. all those sort of things, you know, so it's, uh, it's quite a uh, process. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really get started when i was in florida and when i was in england i was focused mainly on clinical mm -hmm. and teaching and it was only when i came to ohio state where in order to get a promotion it was absolutely required that you had yeah. to absolutely do, you know, papers for your promotion and tenure that i uh, got started on funded research amazing amazing okay so sir let's talk a bit about this book so yeah, yeah. So this book that you wrote, 
is basically considered gold standard for fixed prosthodontics. So my first question to you is what made you author a book like this? And how was that journey of compiling this book? What struggles did you have to face? Right. So originally, um, I was friendly with some of the people at the Mosby Company. Now it's Elsevier, but at that time mm -hmm. it was Mosby. And okay. I, they'd sent me some books to review and then help process. And, you know, so I kind of enjoyed doing that. I've yeah. always enjoyed writing. And then at some point, um, and I was, you know, pretty young and early in my career, um, they were looking for a replacement for their fixed prosthodontic textbook, okay. um, which had been updated. That was the Tillman book, and it hadn't been updated. And they, in fact, it was updated, but in a, for a different publisher. So it kind of mm -hmm. Mosby uh, lost that. So they were looking for one, and they said, well, maybe you guys can do it, you know. So my my uh, colleagues got together and said well yeah we have some sample chapters and that's that was the start of it amazing amazing and did you have to face any struggles along the way when you were compiling this yeah book? you won't believe this either because when we started we didn't have computers so there was oh, no wow okay no, no. same for my thesis so everything okay was typed and we had they had Xerox machines. So oh, yeah. make the changes on things we submitted, it was literally cut and paste. So you oh, literally typed out the changes, cut them up with scissors, pasted it, and then re-Xeroxed it to make Oh my correct. God. Okay. So wow. That, so the, that was in the early 1980s. And then before mm -hmm. we actually finished the first edition that was published in 1985. Um, yeah, then by that time we had word processing and the yeah. whole, uh, so it would made it all a little easier. Okay, perfect, perfect. So, sir, so you have a 50 years, you have 50 years of experience. In today's day, if I had to ask you, what would your advice be to a young dentist as to what a young dentist's mindset should be? What would you advise him? Well, I, I, I'm in education, so I've got to uh, advise the more education you get, the yeah. more knowledge you have, the, the higher your expertise. That, that's what you're marketing. You know, that's what your Absolutely. business depends on. So, that, so I think the, the higher the quality that you offer your patients, yeah. everyone gets from that. And it makes the, the profession more satisfying and it's Absolutely. Also better for the patient. So, yeah, go read books. Um, what develop you yourself professionally. Develop your profession. That's absolutely. That's, absolutely. Yeah. that's and, you know, I love to lecture. Um, until this lockdown, I travel all over the world. At, yes. But that's in Pakistan. I've been to India a few times. Uh, so next time, I have to be. Pakistan. You should. You should. Uh, we should definitely, once this, uh, which actually brings me to my next question, sir. Let's talk a bit about the coronavirus. So you're a graduate of 1977. You saw how dentistry evolved during the 1980s when, you know, the aid, uh, when AIDS came and, uh, you know, you had to change those cross-infection protocols during that era. And this is, in my opinion, and generally, in general opinion, this is something similar to that. So where do you see dentistry going within the next few years? And what do you think generally the future of dentistry is post-COVID? So certainly, I mean, when I started, we only wore gloves for oral surgery. Wow. Okay. So, you know, when you were working in private practice, dent dentists never, never wore gloves. Wow. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely correct. And that, uh, that came along with the AIDS crisis. I think almost a bigger crisis that never happened really was, was the prion crisis, right. mad cow disease. Yeah, mad cow disease, yep. England, you know, and even today, I always used to give blood, you know, as a, as a volunteer, blood mm -hmm. donor. But now in the US, they won't take the blood of anyone who has lived in England or uh, for more than 
three months or six months from certain years, you know, wow. okay. because of the concern. So, so that still uh, affects, but I think at the time, the prions, I mean, they're almost impossible to destroy. So they were talking about single use hand pieces, you know, or they, they couldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to autoclave, you know, autoclaving didn't remove the prions. So that, you know, that could have been a far greater impact, I think, on, on practice. Because it, currently, when we, we've implemented a lot of measures for yeah. the COVID-19 in the practice, and we're seeing far fewer patients, and, you know, we've got the masks and shields, I have to say that with my mask and shield, I can hardly see anything. So Absolutely. Absolutely. going downhill, but um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, manage that but yeah it's it's uh, it's scary we don't want to get sick that's for sure Hope, you know, hopefully a vaccine will come along before too terribly long and we'll be able to overcome this challenge absolutely absolutely hopefully okay so once again i, I want to go come back to another question that I've already asked you. You've seen dentistry change a lot over the past 50 years. Now, if I was supposed to ask you, where is dentistry going within the next 50 years when I'll be practicing in 2169, uh, 2069, I'm sorry. Where do you see dentistry going within the next 50 years with newer technology, newer methods? Where do you see it going? Well, I mean, I think the surpri some surprising things to me is what have, hasn't changed. Okay. So we, we don't have a cure for caries. We still, <laughs> every day in practice, we're still treating caries the way we did in the 1960s. Absolutely. We cure for periodontal disease. Um, we don't have a cure for wear, abrasion, abfraction. You know, wow. we see all those things still. Um, I'm, a, I'm still amazed that the end. <laughs> Dentists are putting little rubber pieces of rubber into teeth. You know, that's the best way <laughs> to call virus. I mean, you'd think there'd be some little sprinkle powder on that would absolutely, take. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, so it's, uh, it, there's, a lot, there's a lot that needs to change. And I'm sure most of those things, will, in your 50 years, most of those things. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay, so, sir... Uh, we're moving towards the later part of our interview, towards the end part of our interview. Now, you have so many great achievements in your life, your books, your articles, your academic establishments. If I had to, if you had to choose one accomplishment that you're the most proud of, what would that one achievement be? Oh, you've got to say your kid, right? Sorry? <laughs> you have to say your, your child. Okay. Sure. <laughs> no, but I meant professionally in dentistry. <laughs> Well, I think it's my textbook. Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, this one. You know, I travel a lot. Absolutely, and you know, you the, the audience hasn't seen you. You know, you know, you, it's a country you've never visited before, but they know who I am because absolutely. they're familiar with that textbook. So that it in academics, what really counts, you know, the peer-reviewed articles, the funded research, yeah, and but textbook. Um, you know, the students need textbooks, and it's certainly the benefit, I mean, is, is in recognition in terms of people uh, knowing who you are. So, yeah, I, I'm very Absolutely. proud. Absolutely. And we're Absolutely. working on a edition number six at the moment. Yeah, because uh, the one I have is edition number five. So, yeah, that's, uh, so it will be a while before we have six. We're always, okay. you know, the, the, the uh, publishers... Um, okay. Perfect, perfect. perfect, 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 perfect. <laughs> okay, so, uh, sir, uh, one of uh, my second last question to you is uh, now this, this is a question from my team, and we've always had this debate in Pakistan. When we were studying last year during my final year, when I was studying with my friends, I used to go to the library, I used to take this book with me, I used to study, and there was this one day where we debated that what's the correct pronunciation of this author's name. And <laughs> I said it was Rosenstiel. Some of my friends said it was Rosenstiel. Some of my friends said it was Rosenstiel. And some of my friends had, 
had other pronunciation. So just go on the record and tell Pakistani no, dentists. Yeah. You, you're absolutely right, Rosenstiel. Yeah. Rosenstiel, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. But it, it's commonly mispronounced because it's originally, you know, it's a German yep. uh, last name. So that's that's why it's often mispronounced. Absolutely, absolutely. That's probably the reason. Okay, so sir, when uh, once this uh, COVID-19 situation passes by, hopefully, and, you know, all of us get through it, when would you be willing to come for a lecture to Pakistan? Because we know that you have a huge fan following over here. I'm always happy to come. Um, I don't need a, a, you know, a stipend or anything, but what I do need is business class. <laughs> too old to fly all the way from the United States to Lahore. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm. You have. You don't have to worry about the hosting of Pakistanis. We're we're That's known for our hospitality and our. And if you can, if you can take me to a cricket match, that would always. always we, oh, we would love you. We would love that. Pakistanis die for Pakistanis would die for cricket. The passion. I, I love cricket. Is, and the other thing I love to do, and I think. There is in Pakistan is is skiing, right? Downhill skiing. Yep, there's a skiing over here as well in Malam Jabba. Yep. So uh, yeah, so if you invite me in the right time of year, you can take me skiing too. I love to do. It. Did you get? I, a I've lectured a couple of times in Iran, and they have very mm -hmm. good skiing in Iran. Yeah. Big mountains, and the the mountains are near Tehran, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, when I was there, the season was yeah. December. But the season hadn't started, so oh. I wasn't going to go skiing in oh. but maybe perfect. next. Perfect, perfect. Uh, did you follow the Cricket World Cup last year where England of won? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Even my son, you know, who, I mean, he's American, he has no interest in cricket, but he kind of got into, and he was so excited by the World Cup and the final. And the, the final. final. The final. <laughs> oh my God, what happened in the final? Uh, Crazy, yeah. The greatest absolutely. cricket match of all time, in my opinion. <laughs> okay. So, so when the next one is the T20 world, right? Yeah, so, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Sir, back. our last question to you. Any last advice for the dentists of Pakistan and any last advice to us for this startup? No, just enjoy your profession and um, look after your patients and be, be safe in the current environment and um, in, in, enjoy and uh, give back. Hopefully you uh, consider teaching and give yeah, back to absolutely. them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thanks for having me. And, thank uh, you. Enjoy. Thank you so much, sir. It really meant a lot. This is the greatest honor that I've had during uh, the one year of dental career that I've had talking to you. Congratulations on starting. Interviewing you. Thank you so you much. Are you practice? Are you practicing? I'm not currently, uh, I'm currently practicing, but I'm just uh, not exactly practicing right now. Uh, dentists over here are majorly closed because the yeah. cases are still yeah. spiking. So we're in a bit of, bit of a hiccup. So let's hope everything. Important is to be safe. That's yep. for sure. Don't, okay. Well, thank you. I'll say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much, sir. It was an honor. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. Stay safe.